Virginia is the mother state of our country. The first permanent settlement of America occurred in 1607 at Jamestown. In the years thereafter, immigrants moved westward, up such rivers as the James and the Rappahannock. Other settlers poured southward from Pennsylvania into the great Shenandoah Valley and the rolling hill country known as the Piedmont. The soil was plentiful and profitable. Log cabins, stately mansions, and growing villages soon dotted the land. Tobacco, grain, and livestock became basic crops. River towns such as Alexandria, Fredericksburg, Richmond, and Petersburg grew into major ports for shopping produce to the world. A century of progress passed, and Virginia again became a mother state, this time in the political formation of an American nation. Its sons were leading voices among the founding fathers. Patrick Henry issued the famous call for liberty. Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence. George Washington led the American armies to victory. James Madison was chief architect of the U.S. Constitution. John Marshall became the greatest of the chief justices of the Supreme Court. Six of the first 10 presidents of the United States were Virginians. For 40 years, the new nation, including Virginia, enjoyed uninterrupted progress. Agricultural productivity increased steadily. Canal building and the coming of the railroads shortened distance between two points, and those cities soon became commercial centers. And at the top of the list stood Richmond, Virginia, which could soon boast of the Tredegar Iron Works, the largest such foundry in the entire South. And yet, the dark cloud of slavery loomed above, growing heavier and darker with the years. It was like a storm waiting to explode. Slavery had existed in the original American colonies since the beginning. It was the development of the cotton gin which impacted the, the rise of slavery and increased its uh, profitability in the South, whereas in the North, slavery declined because it was considered unprofitable and in some cases even immoral. With the compromise after the establishment of the United States Constitution, the tensions came to the forefront as far as North and South were concerned over the issue of slavery. Southerners increasingly believed that they could not survive without slavery. Northerners increasingly believed that the nation was better off without it. As the South became more pro-slavery, the North increasingly became more anti-slavery. Slaveholders defended their society and culture with a variety of arguments. Slavery had existed in all the great civilizations of history. Even the Bible referred to slavery many times as a way of life. Black people were an inferior race and needed to be treated as children. They were fed, clothed, and cared for from the cradle to the grave. To eliminate slavery would mean the economic destruction of America's most wealth-producing region. Abolitionists were persons opposed to slavery on moral and humane grounds. They also felt it was incompatible with American democracy. Slaves had no rights in the United States. They had no civil or human rights. In most southern states, it was illegal for slaves to learn how to read and write because reading and writing led to education, and education led to ideas. Ideas led to self-expression, and self-expression led to the idea that a person should be free. Virginia became the site of the bloodiest slave revolt in American history. In August 1831, a slave named Nat Turner and 60 followers went on a killing spree in Southampton County. Over 60 white people, mostly women and children, were slaughtered before white posses tracked down the murderers. Civil wars are not like conflicts between two nations. In the Civil War, both sides are from the same country. They speak the same language, they have the same likes and dislikes, they share a common past. And the Civil War comes slowly, usually as a result of one argument after another, each building on top of each other with tension and emotion. And when you get into a situation like that, you have talking leading to arguing, arguing leading to shouting, and shouting leading to shooting. The American Civil War followed that same pattern in its development. By the 1840s, slavery was flashing angrily across the land, and the fight to end it involved that too. And this was such that the two major denominations 
Baptist and Methodist both split into northern and southern wings, and the issue was simple. Can a good Christian be a slaveholder? War with Mexico in 1846 to 1848 made the areas of Texas, California, and all the territory in between part of the United States. Southern fields were wearing out from the constant planting of cotton. The lands gained from Mexico seemed to offer a splendid opportunity for the expansion of cotton and slavery. Yet northern leaders who had opposed the Mexican War were just as determined to keep the newly acquired Southwestern Empire free from slavery. Virginia-born Henry Clay now stepped once again onto center stage. Thirty years earlier, the persuasive Kentucky senator had fashioned the Missouri Compromise as a temporary peace. According to that bill, it would stretch a line across the United States, south of which slave states would be permitted, north of which they would not be allowed. Now, in 1850, bent by age, broken in health, Clay came forward with yet another set of proposals which he hoped would save the union he loved. California would enter the union as a free state, with the rest of the lands taken from Mexico to be settled on the basis of what was called popular sovereignty. By this principle, the people of each new territory would decide for themselves whether to join the union as a free or slave state. Such a choice seemed to fit perfectly with the long-held American belief in the right of self-determination. The Compromise of 1850 also included stiffer legislation to govern the capture and return of runaway slaves. As is usually the case with compromises, everybody got something and everybody was disappointed. The South got a new fugitive slave law, but the issue of popular sovereignty and just when and how territories could adopt or reject slavery was not completely settled. It would remain a bone of contention for the next 10 years and chiefly as a result of that one issue. The next 10 years after the Compromise of 1850 would only lead to escalation. Arguably one of the most important events of the 19th century, certainly as it relates to the Civil War era, is the publication in 1852 of Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uncle Tom's Cabin was a novel written by Harriet Beecher Stowe. And what's significant about Mrs. Stowe is that she comes from a very strong abolitionist anti-slavery family. And so in writing her work, she infuses this spirit within it, condemning slavery. Where she emphasizes the most is what slavery does to slave families. Uh, prior to this point, Northerners could agree that slavery was wrong. But Uncle Tom's Cabin showed them it was wrong because, among the other reasons, is the ease with which slave families would be split up and sold. One of the biggest threats uh, to slaves is that of losing a loved one. Um, and not just a loved one, it could be the whole family being split apart. Um, a lot of times when planters go off to buy slaves, it's not always uh, taking the whole family. He takes what he needs, and sometimes it's just the women and children. It could be just the men. It just depends on what their job is. There are many reasons why Uncle Tom's Cabin, then, is, is considered the most influential work in American history, and again, certainly uh, with regards to the Civil War era. What to do with the vast, unsettled lands of the Louisiana Purchase now became part of the controversy. In 1854, Northern congressmen who cared nothing about slavery joined with Southern colleagues to pass the Kansas-Nebraska Act. The act created two huge territories, Kansas and Nebraska. In each, popular sovereignty would determine whether the area would be a free or slave state. Northerners rushed to Kansas to make it a free state, while Southerners rushed to make it a slave state. Radical abolitionists such as John Brown were willing to use violence to secure their ends, and in fact Brown and a group of his men murdered five pro-slavery settlers in Kansas. At the same time, a pro-slavery activists destroyed the town of Lawrence to pursue their ends of making Kansas a slave state. By mid-1856, Kansas was earning the nickname Bleeding Kansas. 
By the early 1850s, there were only two political parties left in America, and then the Whigs disintegrated over slavery. That just left the Democrats, and soon slavery began to fragment the Democrats as well. Into that vacuum stepped a new political party, the Republicans, made up of several elements of former political parties who often didn't agree with each other on much, except one thing, and that was that they all opposed the extension of slavery. To Southern leaders, a threat to the extension of slavery meant ultimately a threat to slavery itself. Then the Supreme Court entered the controversy. In March 1857, it rendered a decision regarding a slave named Dred Scott. The High Court ruled that a slave was not a citizen, but private property, whose owner could take it anywhere in the United States without threat. This decision essentially rendered the Missouri Compromise, the Compromise of 1850, and the Kansas-Nebraska Act unconstitutional. Uneasy months followed. Clouds of sectionalism seemed to block out the sunshine of national unity. President James Buchanan of Pennsylvania had few friends, and most of them were Southerners. And Buchanan felt confused over what he was supposed to do in this national crisis. Meanwhile, the Congress talked much, said little, and did nothing. In such an atmosphere, a small spark was going to produce a great flame. It came in mid-October, 1859, in the person of John Brown. A lifelong failure in every business venture he ever undertook, John Brown became a fiery apostle for the abolitionist cause. He convinced himself that the elimination of slavery could only come through the shedding of blood. On a rainy night in October, 1859, John Brown came here to Harper's Ferry and seize the federal arsenal. This was the first step in his plan to call upon all the slaves in the region to join him, Brown, who, like some modern-day Moses, would lead the black men to freedom. Unfortunately, the plan was ill-conceived and carried out in chaos. Brown forgot to issue his call. He brought no supplies with him. Uh, he had no escape route plan. Moreover, his men shot and killed four innocent townspeople, including a black man. Soon, some 90 Marines under the command of Army Colonel Robert E. Lee arrived on the scene. Brown and his band took refuge in the small fire engine house here at Harpers Ferry. The detachment of Marines sent up from Washington stormed the building and with club muskets and bayonets easily put down the insurrectionists. Brown was quickly tried and convicted and just as quickly publicly hanged at nearby Charlestown on December 3rd, 1859. The John Brown Raid was badly planned and poorly executed, but it had repercussions far beyond the importance of the event itself. In the North, free state people looked on John Brown as a hero, a martyr to the cause of freedom who had struck a blow to end slavery. In the South, he was viewed as a terrorist, they all remember the Nat Turner Rebellion and people being murdered in the night with axes and pitchforks. Militia groups began to form all over the South and here in Virginia as they feared a new slave rebellion. John Brown had tolled the bell again in 1859 and it wouldn't stop ringing until the nation was consumed in fire. The national mood worsened with the presidential election of 1860. Democrats could not agree on a platform, much less on a candidate. The party collapsed into three factions, each with its own presidential nominee. Republicans advocated economic and political programs that would help growth in the northern states. They bypassed their outspoken leaders and nominated the less controversial Abraham Lincoln. The plain and lanky Midwesterner won the presidency with but 40% of the popular vote. In most southern states, Lincoln's name was not even on the ballot. The election of a president from a political party pledged to block the extension of slavery was a development the South could not accept. On December 18, 1860, South Carolina seceded from the Union. Six other states followed suit, and in Montgomery, Alabama, they established the Confederate States of America. The delegates chose Jefferson Davis of Mississippi to be president with Alexander H. Stevens of Georgia picked to be vice president. Two months later, the Confederate capital was moved here to the more prestigious and important city of Richmond. 
national events moved rapidly to the final step. The Lincoln administration would not accept any state having the right to leave the Union. Lincoln refused the South's demands that the federal government abandon its forts and arsenals inside the Confederate states. One of those Union garrisons was Fort Sumter in the harbor of Charleston, South Carolina. At dawn on April 12, Confederate cannon massed on three sides of Fort Sumter opened fire. The bombardment lasted 34 hours before the Union defenders lowered their flag in surrender. The firing on Fort Sumter was clearly an act of war. Lincoln had taken a constitutional oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Union. He had no choice but to issue a call for volunteers to put down that rebellion. He called for 75,000 and sent those calls out in proportion to the several states. They went, in addition to the free states, to the slave states that had not yet seceded. Virginia, Maryland, Missouri, Tennessee. Now, at last, those border states couldn't sit on the fence anymore. They were either going to have to answer to Lincoln's call or take sides with the South. For Virginia, the time to decide had come. Virginians felt that the federal government did not have the right to send soldiers marching across its land without Virginia's permission. On April 17, the Old Dominion cut its ties with the nation that it had done so much to create. At the outset of the war, the territory between Petersburg and Richmond and Fredericksburg was the industrial center of the states that seceded of the Confederacy. And so this became then a, a, a storehouse, a manufacturing center, a workshop for the Confederacy. Virginia was a huge industrial and agricultural jewel that the southern states had to have for any chance of success. Neither North nor South was in the least ready for a war, especially a civil war against each other. Few Americans had any idea of the immense demands this war was going to make. After all, emotion had to place reason, and heated feelings existed where cool logic should have been. The war aims of the two sides were simple. The Confederacy was fighting for independence. The North was fighting to preserve the Union. Compromise? No compromise is possible. One side must conquer, and the other side must be conquered. <laughs>